Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I fell into the hospitality industry like a lot of people do in their teenage years. I uh, was a dishwasher in a restaurant and ultimately went to McDonald's and became a manager there. But um, my entree into the hotel business happened right after I got out of the military. I spent a few years there, and my first job out of the military was as a night auditor at a small little no-tell motel in San Francisco, right outside the Tenderloin. And um, if you know the Tenderloin in San Francisco, it's kind of a, a racy, dicey neighborhood right in the shadow of the Federal Building. And um, so I was the night auditor. I went in at midnight and um, got off at 8 o'clock in the morning, went to college during the day, and um, did the whole thing over. Um, every night I'd go and do my job and uh, study for a few hours at night. And ultimately, after just a couple of months, a new um, ownership group came into this little property. And, um, and I became quick friends with the new owner and ultimately became partners. And so we started a hotel, a hotel industry, um, kind of leader in the boutique hotel industry back in uh, 1986 or 87. And, uh, and we grew that company from one, one little motel to about 18 hotels in about a 14 year period. So um, it was really fun. Um, the interesting thing was that neither myself nor my partner had any real experience in the hotel industry, but we weren't, weren't afraid to go out and ask questions of people who were brighter than we were, had a lot more experience than we did, and um, it was just a lot of fun. So it's kind of a unique way to get into the hospitality industry, but uh, we learned a lot. Well, you know, our, our mission is pretty simple. Um, it really is to inspire significance and distinction in all we do. And um, we don't say anything about the hotel industry in that or the hospitality industry because we recognize that, you know, in 20 years we may be doing something completely different than just managing and operating hotels. We may be operating theme parks or, <laughs> or a chain of grocery stores. I hope not, but, but I don't know what's going to happen to the organization in, in 15 years. Um, but what we really try to do is everybody we touch, we want to have a distinct and significant impact. Now that might mean that, um, oh, um, our, our team members or our employees, we want to make sure that they've got a great work environment. We want to make sure that they're highly, or at least fairly compensated, and that they've got good benefits packages. Um, for our investors, it might mean that they get higher than typical results on their uh, return on their equity. Uh, for our communities, it might mean that um, we um, support charitable organizations that are close and dear to their hearts. Um, so that's kind of the significant part. The distinction part really has to do with providing quality product. What we've learned in the hospitality industry over the past 20 some years is that there are a lot of just vanilla hotel products out there that lack soul, that lack, you know, any kind of inspiration. It's just a real vanilla bland product. So our company is a little bit different in that we develop um, boutique hotels. Um, which means that they're more service driven, more style driven. Um, and so we're trying to bring uh, great customer service, a sense of style uh, to the masses instead of just to the elite. So we try to, try to look at ourselves as more of an inclusive organization rather than an exclusive organization. I don't know that there are secrets. Um, but what we try to do is get it right on the hiring side. Too often people are just willing to hire a warm body. Um, what we have tried to do is um, get to the service mentality or service spirit with people before they ever come on board. And by that I mean, you know, you know when you walk around, uh, whether it's a bank or a coffee shop or a hotel, there are people who just have a hospitable spirit about them. Um, the crazy thing is, I think in the hotel industry, that people forget, hey, we're in the hospitality industry, we need to be hospitable, which means a smile and extending themselves and have kind of a, a gracious spirit about them. So we try to find those things out before we ever bring people on board. We have a spirit in our organization, um, or kind of a culture where we tend to be, what we say, um, slow to hire and quick to fire. Um, so we're trying to find the right person for the right job. Um, and by the quick to fire, I don't mean, hey, I don't like the way you combed your hair today, so you're gone. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is that most of us have had the experience where we've hired someone, and three days into it, we just know that it's not going to work. You know, you know that either you made a mistake hiring, or um, there's just a not, the, the fit isn't right on the personality side. 
So instead of that letting that linger out to 89 days, and that turns into 120 days, and that turns into three years, and you're just kicking yourself, pretty quickly early on in the job, we have a formal 30-day review where we sit down with our team members and it gives them an opportunity to review us where they say, hey, you know what, Larry? You know what, Jim? You guys said that your organization was going to be this way and I'm not finding it to be that way. So I'm gonna, I think that we need to either fix that or I need to go find another job. And it gives us an opportunity to say, hey, Bill, Susie, um, we really need you to get a little bit more focused in this area. And it builds a dialogue right out of the gate so that people feel comfortable approaching their managers and supervisors. Um, so we have kind of a real open culture that starts from day one in the organization. <laughs> you had to bring that up. <laughs> you know, I think there is. Um, really, I think more than anything else, it's um, understanding the importance of camaraderie and teamwork. Um, in Special Forces and the Green Berets, we work in 12-man A-teams. And um, that's a pretty small unit. And uh, we travel around pretty uh, extensively. And oftentimes, we've all heard stories about a 12-man A-team taking on a much larger military unit. But what that taught me was that um, when you share a common vision, you can outmaneuver and outman um, a larger organization any day of the week. And uh, we've all seen the David and Goliath stories in, in life. Um, so there's that sense of camaraderie and teamwork, but also just a tenacious spirit, a never quit attitude. Um, we can talk about this a little bit later, but I started this company in a pretty difficult economic time, economic climate. And if I would have just curled up in a ball and said, hey, you know, this is bigger than me, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I think the uh, sense of teamwork and camaraderie and a uh, tenacious spirit. I think that this needs to be, I don't know that it's a skill set, but it might be more character traits. Um, I think certainly you need to be visionary. You need to have that tenacious spirit. Um, you've got to have a bit of an ego, and I don't mean that in a bad sense. I mean, um, a lot of people are going to tell you to stay on the straight and narrow, stay on the path that everyone else has been on, stay with you know, um, the safe bet. And certainly there are plenty of people who told me that. Um, so I think that you need to believe in yourself and you need to believe that you can do it when everyone else says that you can't. Um, on the skill set side, I suppose being a multitasker is amazingly important. Um, when you start an organization, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, you don't have the revenue to pay for the legions of people um, that a more established or mature organization is going to have from the finance side to the operation side to the marketing side. When I started this company, um, we, uh, you know, I did all of that uh, by myself and uh, would tap into networks of people to help me out. But today we have uh, an infrastructure that we didn't have six years ago when we started the organization. So I think being a multitasker is probably a pretty important skill. Well, I started this company after um, about 15 years with, uh, with my former company. So I had a track record in the industry. Um, now the timing came in that um, I put our first hotel into escrow, Broughton Hospitality Hotel into escrow, in November of 2000. Um, people were making a lot of money in the hospitality industry back then. Um, frankly, if you open the doors at most hotels in the country at the time, you could make money. But about that time was when the dot-com bomb began in the U.S. A national recession followed in early 2001. Um, and then there was uh, SARS, you know, the avian flu. Uh, so people from Asia just stopped traveling. At the time, uh, they made up about a third of um, uh, the travelers to San Francisco, where most of my personal investments were. And then, of course, 9-11 was really the nail in the coffin. And so, um, personally, I had a lot of assets tied up in hotels in San Francisco, and that market took a 45% beating during that time. So we lost 45% value uh, of our hotels like that. So um, although I was able to raise money for that first hotel, 
that we put in escrow in November of 2000. We closed escrow in January of 2001. And um, at that point, after that, banks wouldn't return phone calls. You couldn't raise equity. Um, it was a scary time because people simply weren't traveling. So yeah, I, I would say that um, during that era of 2001, it was difficult to raise money. Throughout the West Coast, we have a property in Ubud, Indonesia that we do uh, sales and marketing for. But for those properties that we actually own or operate, uh, they run from, um, let's see here, Palm Desert, Santa Barbara, Solvang, um, uh, Lake County, California, um, Santa Monica, so mostly West Coast properties. We do have about a uh, half dozen properties that are in the pipeline at this point, um, and those are very in various stages of entitlement or acquisition. Most of them are new build projects. Uh, we have one here in Orange County. Um, we've got one up in uh, Santa Barbara County. We are looking at markets like Miami, New York, Chicago, Boston, um, you know, primary markets. But we believe that the boutique hotel industry, the industry that we serve, uh, boutique hotels could go in virtually any market. You know, with the proliferation of um, oh, cable TV, uh, you can turn on the TV any time of the day or night and see shows on design, um, how to renovate your home or renovate you know, virtually anything. So the level of style um, has really permeated every aspect of the American culture at this point. So it's not just heavy urban environments that you go to like San Francisco or New York where you see, see style conscious people now. You see them in very rural areas as well. So we'd like to bring that down, um, you know, not down, but we'd like it to bring it into every market in the U.S. So uh, we think that there's a huge opportunity for us. It's an interesting question, I suppose, but I love Indonesia. I love Bali uh, specifically. Um, this was a hotel that my former company used to uh, have in their portfolio. Um, if you've not been to, to Bali, it's just a very special place. Um, the arts culture um, is alive and well there. There's, unlike a lot of island nations, where there is kind of a real masculine feel uh, to the culture because it had been invaded for centuries, um, this has a much more um, hospitable, almost feminine feel to the island. Um, the hotel that we do sales and marketing for is owned by the Prince of Ubud, and it's just a very special place. It's where two rivers meet, and so that's kind of holy ground um, there in Bali. But also, um, you know, I've got, have had an interest in religions for a long, long time, or spirituality, I suppose, and, uh, you know, the, it's just a very interesting and intriguing part of the world. And so uh, they said, hey, Larry, we'd love for you to help us out here. And so we were glad to, uh, to help them out because, frankly, Bali was hit really badly during some of the terrorist bombings that happened not so long ago. And they needed a hand uh, try to try to get Americans and North American uh, travelers to, uh, to Bali and Ubud. So we said we'd be glad to help you out. Gosh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I just met, uh, what's today? Just met a couple of days ago with the um, Minister of Tourism for El Salvador. That's an interesting country. There's a lot going on there. It's an absolutely beautiful country. Um, frankly, when I was in the military, that was a hot spot um, of civil unrest and uh, civil war. Um, but that's behind them now. They're one of the most uh, stable democracies in Central America. And um, it's absolutely beautiful with uh, it's great scuba diving and um, they've got amazing volcanoes there and they've got uh, an economy that's growing leaps and bounds every year. So we're looking there. Um, we've had opportunities to look at projects in, uh, in, in London and the UK. So we're looking. Um, they'd have to be really special projects though. And our strategy has been though that if we are going to get one hotel in a distant market, we're pretty quickly going to have to get a couple of more so that we have economies of scale with both staffing and marketing. Um, so it's, uh, it's a big world out there, but you know, it's getting smaller every year. And uh, we think that with the cost of travel um, being uh, you know, a little bit more to, easier to reach, I guess, for most people, um, we're, we'll look elsewhere. Africa is another place that's really fond uh, to me. I studied uh, 
African politics when I was in college, and I just got back from a three-week trip to Zimbabwe. Uh, I'd love to have a couple of hotels in Africa someday. So, you know, anywhere that kind of personally intrigues me, I'm sure we'll look. Uh, we'll look. I used to speak Russian. <laughs> um, yeah, I spent a year at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. Um, and I wish I could speak Russian as well as I used to. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, Moscow scares me a little bit. Um, it is quite a ways away. Um, but um, we'll see. You know, I, there was a time when I did fantasize about that. Um, I don't know that I could convince my wife or my business partner to, to, go, to go to Moscow right now. You know, I think that this touches back on uh, when we started the company in 2001, just a very difficult time when it was hard to get financing and, um, and with my own personal net wealth, uh, you know, basically dry, shriveling up. Because I was also starting a family at that time. Um, my first child was born in 2001 and, um, you know, my wife was really looking for safety and security. and. Um, and I had started a new company during the worst economic time that the hotel industry had seen since before 2001. And so I had family members who were saying, you know, Larry, what are you doing? I had my wife who was saying, you got to go get a job. And I was saying, Suzanne, um, that'd be great, but I'm an entrepreneur. I'm unemployable. <laughs> I can't get a job. Um, and so that was a huge challenge, starting a company and starting a family um, during that difficult time of, you know, 2001, 2002. But thank God, you know, I kept my eye on the ball. Um, I tend to be a visionary, a little bit too crazy sometimes. But I knew that if we held true to our core values of honesty, integrity, and ethics, and all we do, that we knew that that was going to be one of our competitive advantages. Um, because, you know, in business, there are people who are willing to compromise all the time. And particularly when the going gets tough, that's really a time when people's core values are tested. So I knew that if we held true to that, that we were going to come out of this. And we have. Uh, we became known during that difficult time as turnaround artists. There were a lot of people who were hanging on by their fingertips onto their properties, and they'd heard great things about how we were able to gain market share during a declining economy. And so we were able to pick up some pretty high-profile clients at the time. And um, so I tell you what, it was a great learning experience, and I guess it built a lot of character. I hope I never have to go through, through it again. Um, but that was probably the biggest challenge um, to my career. Yes, oh my gosh, my wife and I were talking about this the other night because I've kind of slacked off on that in the past year. Um, you know, people are always out there trying to, you know, bring the latest and greatest thing to the hotel industry. And there's been a phenomenon in the hotel industry called uh, amenity creep. What that means is that uh, amenities and services that you used to only get at the highest level of hotels the five-star products um, have become less expensive or people have figured out a ways to implement services that don't cost a lot and so that continues to come down um, the, um, the quality scale I suppose. So um, having high-end amenities, bath amenities for instance, was something you'd only get at the best hotels. Well now it's you, you find them in the two and three-star products. Um, so we're always looking at other hotels. We're always looking at uh, design because that sends, tends to be a pretty good um, way to separate yourselves from the pack as well. But you know, it's interesting that uh, we can go visit hotels all we want, and, uh, but if we don't execute properly at our properties, it doesn't matter how good, how beautiful your design is or how great your amenities are. If you're not um, meeting people's needs, uh, it doesn't matter. It really goes all the way. And so I think another one of our, I guess, uh, elements of our competitive advantage is that the top executives in our organization have all worked virtually every position in a hotel. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was a night auditor, but I've served as an executive housekeeper, and I've worked in the kitchens and made beds and checked people in and out and served in management positions. And that's the same way with every other senior level executive in our organization. Most hotel companies that are out there, the CEO, the president, the top executives are attorneys or real estate jockeys or, or CPAs and they don't know the importance of uh, you know making sure that uh, your team members have the right tools to do their jobs so um, and we can also you know there's a level of trust 
I suppose, and camaraderie that we have with our line level, quote unquote, uh, team members that, uh, that a CPA or an attorney is never going to have. I think it's probably just building relationships with people and being able to spot rising stars in the industry. Um, you know, I don't have a finance background. I don't have a marketing background. I love those things. I tend to be quite good at those things. Um, but really what comes easy is just building relationships with people. And that's quite important and oftentimes overlooked when growing an organization because um, the economy is going to go up and down. It really is. Um, and uh, we may not always be able to give people the best benefits packages or always pay people the most amount of money or they may not have the most, um, I don't know, the, the most opulent office space. But if you build a relationship with somebody, um, if you show them that you love them, you care for them, you want the best for them, they're willing to walk across coals for you. They'll walk over glass for you. Um, and so that's really important. And I don't do it just to build loyalty. I do it because it's the right thing to do. And um, so, you know, what they say is, you know, leaders tend to attract people like them. And so we built a culture in our organization of uh, senior executives and managers who have kind of the same outlook on life. And so we have a pretty unique culture because of that. So I don't know that it comes easy, but it's, I think it's just part of my spirit is that I can build relationships with people quite easily. Management. <laughs> um, management and leadership, I think, are oftentimes confused. Um, when I was younger, um, I could work outside my comfort zone a little bit. I would just work harder than anybody else on management. Um, uh, you know, when I looked at uh, performance reviews or personnel appraisals over my career, people always say, oh, you're a great manager. But now, where I am at, you know, my mid-40s, and I see what I've grown, I recognize, you know, I wasn't a great manager. Jim Schichta, who's in our organization, my business partner, the number two guy in our company, he is a phenomenal manager. He's a great manager and he loves it. Well, I tend to be a better leader. Um, and, you know, I can set the course, I can chart the course, I can get the people together, um, I can come up with a big picture, strategic ideas, but then implementing, I'm not so good at that anymore. Um, so the, uh, you know, herding cats that a lot of managers have to do, I'm not so great at that. So it comes a little bit difficult uh, for me. For me personally, what works doesn't work for a lot of other people. And I would just suggest that when people are looking for time management skills or tools, that they just try a bunch of different things. Um, you know, I've got my little trio you know, PDA thing that I use a lot, and I use Outlook quite a bit. But when it comes back to it, I, I don't walk, I don't go anywhere without my little sheet here. And I've been using this system for 20 some years. And uh, all I do is I write things down. It's basically a daily to-do sheet. I've got a page for every day of the week in here. Each little section on here has, you know, a property or a, an executive that I need to be speaking with. And um, because my brain is going 100 miles an hour. And something might come to me in the middle of the night or it might come to me during a meeting that, hey, I need to talk to Jim about, you know, personnel performances and, uh, and then just, uh, or personnel appraisals. And just, uh, I make a note to myself and then I can let my brain go, you know, free on other things. That works for me. This thing never leaves my side. I've got it, um, uh, you know, a weird color so that when it's sitting on my desk amongst other papers, I can easily see it. Now that took me a long time to find it. You know, I, I, I would love to be one of these Blackberry type people and that's the only thing that they've got, but it doesn't work for me. Um, so that's how I manage my time. I've, got, I've gotten pretty good at delegating and uh, people in the organization um, have been quite good at working with me. I tend to be a, a schizophrenic all over the board kind of guy. So we set up a system with Outlook where people will put tentative things in my calendars and, uh, and then we touch base. So it's it's, not rocket science, it's not very sexy, but it works for me. That's a hard one, I've gotta be honest with you, because although I don't like to get 
into the details, um, the details are really important. And so I have a tendency, I suppose, to be a bit of a micromanager on new projects, on marketing um, initiatives. Um, so I guess it's, it comes down to this level of comfort. Once I feel like a project is moving in the right direction and um, I'm, I'm a little bit freer to let things go and delegate those kind of things. Um, you know, the last, I guess, two years, I've really tried to get much more deliberate about letting people go off and just make mistakes. Um, it hurts. It really does. And I've got to kind of gird myself sometimes against saying, oh, gosh, you know, we made this mistake before. Why are we making the mistake again? But I understand that we've attracted people to our organization who are full of integrity and capacity and motivation. And I can't just knock them down every time they make a mistake because that's frankly, that's where we're going to learn. That's where we're going to grow. Um, but it's a challenge. I just, I'll, be, I'll be transparent. It's a challenge to delegate sometimes. But I know that if we're going to grow out of uh, where we are today into that next, uh, you know, the next big thing, um, I've got to be better at it. So I don't have it down yet. I'm not an expert at it. I'm not always comfortable with it. But I know that that's an area I've got to work on. Intercultural with guests, you know, I think that I can't not say that there are issues, but certainly, you know, we get people from various faith backgrounds, you know, Muslims and Buddhists, and, um, and there are certain requirements that they have. Um, I would say that a challenge that we have faced sometimes is that our bathrooms in hotels aren't designed as they would be for, for some Asian countries, um, where there, there just may be a drain. Some countries have not seen a bathtub before or a shower. And so what we have found is that with some of these tour, uh, the buses that bring in you know, 45 people um, from Vietnam, for instance, um, there was a group that they were all bathing in the middle of the bathroom floor with no drain. And so they would fill up um, the bucket, pour it over themselves, and ultimately there was this waterfalls down through the next floor. Um, so I can't say that that's an issue, but it is something that we had to be aware of, um, that uh, perhaps we ought to try to design bathrooms a little bit differently for new hotels that are going to be focusing on um, Southeast Asian tour uh, groups. Um, we have had requests for prayer rooms in some of those hotels um, where there is a heavy Muslim guest population or rooms that face the east. So I wouldn't say that there are issues because we tend to have an approach where we try to work with people. We think that most situations can be overcome if we just communicate. Um, I don't like to bring up um, challenges that other hotel companies have had, but there have been a couple of high-profile cases recently with um, a hotel company where there have been racial profiling um, claims, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but the claims are at least there, and then the, you know they hit the newspapers. So we try to go into a bit of sensitivity training with our properties. We try not to overdo it because, again, we try to hire right. When you hire right, you tend not to have those challenges. But as you grow, the more team members you get on board, the harder it is. So um, you know, we tend to be in an intercultural society nowadays, particularly in the hospitality industry. So I don't think we have the challenges that, that, that other industries might face. You know, we get some pretty strange ones from, um, we had a, uh, um, and I don't know whether this is a joke or not, but the request was real. Uh, we had some, uh, I don't know whether you would call them pagans or you would call them, um, I don't know what they were, but they wanted crows in the, there when they got to their room. Now, we couldn't find any crows. <laughs> um, but uh, when they came in, you know, dressed in, in black and they were kind of, you know, the whole goth kind of uh, feel. Um, we had to do a lot of apologizing because we just couldn't, you know, we couldn't pull it off. Uh, we have had, uh, you know, requests for, we're in the hotel industry, I'll let your imagination <laughs> go. We've had all kinds of sexual requests for people to be in their rooms. We tend not to help people on, on that area. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had people who said, hey, we'd like to have 13 pillows in our room. And we do it. We've had people who say, hey, I've been dating this woman for 15 years and now I've got to, you know, buck up and propose 
and I really need to make this a special engagement. And we've done that, whether it's from getting rose petals, you know, strewn throughout the room, um, to chartering private jets from um, Denver into Santa Barbara. And we do that, and it's a lot of fun, and it's always exciting to watch, you know, how the, the, the big event is gonna come off. But frankly, we're on pins and needles until uh, everybody walks away with a smile because it's, you know, the hotel industry is a pretty intimate industry when you think about it, the hospitality industry. On the, on the restaurant side, we make the food that people put in their mouths. That's pretty intimate when you think about it. Um, we clean the bathrooms where people are naked. We make the beds where people you know, are you know, conceiving their, their children. Um, when we get everybody in the organization understanding that this is an intimate organization, it's an intimate industry, we think our team members look at it a little bit differently than if they were just um, a clerk at a movie theater handing out tickets. So you can just imagine we get some pretty strange requests and uh, we try to accommodate people uh, the best we can. Not really. Um, it comes from the corporate culture, again, that, uh, that you build. For those properties that we know, we're going to have um, celebrity guests, like properties in Santa Barbara, where you know it's kind of a playground for, for people in Hollywood. Or when we were in San Francisco, we got them all the time. Or frankly, even our property, the Georgian, in Santa Monica. Um, so what we end up doing is when we're during the higher and orientation practice uh, pr process, we talk to team members, we say, hey, you know, we're gonna have celebrity guests who are gonna come through here, and we need you to be, uh, keep it confidential. Um, we need you to treat them with dignity and respect, just like you would anyone else. Don't ask for autographs. And we have them sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, and frankly, staff become a little bit, not jaded, but they get a little bit comfortable with it. And, because at the end of the day, we're all humans, you know, we all do the same things. Um, and for most of these people, it's just a job. And we have found the celebrities that we deal with to be amazingly respectful. Um, and, uh, and that makes it easy, too. Now, we've had difficult ones as well who have made crazy requests. Um, but, you know, that's part of our job. So our job is to really make an experience for people. And celebrities are looking for the same things that, uh, that most of us are at the end of the day. Well, you know, my preferred method is face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, you can read body language. You can really get a lot more, you know, done in a shorter period of time. That, the, the way our organization is structured today, that is just not possible. You know, we're up and down the, the West Coast. When I was in San Francisco and we had, you know, 18 properties right there, that was a lot easier to do face-to-face -face meetings. So what we rely on today a lot is... Um, uh, email and uh, conference calls. We, we're currently looking into doing video conferencing. Uh, we know that we're going to need to do that as we grow uh, across the state or across the country and you know go more international. Um, but the preferred is always you know face to face. I think the second is the phone. Uh, what I found kind of challenging is that the younger people who have come to our organization have a tough time with a phone. It's so much easier to do a text message or a, an email. Um, but that has come back to bite us, to be quite honest with you, because you don't get, either you send the wrong emotions when you do an email or a text message, or you don't say enough, or you assume that what you've said, you know, is going to come across right, correctly, um, and it just doesn't. And so we, we find it that we're having to go to people, I don't know if I can put an age on it, but I'll bet you people under 25 we're having to tell people, pick up the phone, talk to them, um, instead of just text messaging them or sending an instant message. Wow, you know, MBA holders, I'm in awe of most MBA holders. <laughs> um, I don't have my MBA. Uh, my former business partner at my San Francisco company uh, had his MBA from Stanford. You know what I love about uh, people who have their MBAs is that they have built a network of really bright people. Um, they've gone through the rigors of doing uh, case studies and analysis on projects. Um, that's a difficult thing for us to teach people because most MBA holders have been through it. They've seen it, they've looked at, you know, they become students of business. That's what I look at myself as. Um, 
although I don't have an MBA, as I said, I love to study business. Well, MBA holders, they've done it. They've done a couple of years of it. And so they bring, I think, a level of, of objectivity to challenges that businesses face that uh, most other people aren't going to have. There's a lot of them. Uh, I think generally, though, it's to build an organization that um, really has a significant impact on the world. Big, lofty, yeah, it is. Um, because my goal is that in the next five years, I'm spending about 60% of my time working on the company. And the other 40% of my time using the company to do philanthropic work. That is contrarian, I think, for most people. I'm not a person that I think, I, don't, I can't imagine I'm ever going to retire. Um, my fantasy is that I you know, work right to the end. But work is the thing in quotation marks. What does that mean? Um, we're trying to find ways to really make positive impacts uh, in, the, in the world, in the community. We've got uh, a business plan uh, for a hotel concept where all the proceeds will go to uh, support microfinance uh, programs in third world developing countries and education programs. That's a pretty big, hairy, audacious goal. My fantasy is to spend most of my time working on that concept um, and then using our company to support that. So certainly personal goals, I'd love to have my, my, my two kids grow up and be, you know, presidents of the U.S. and my wife to be happy and, and, uh, and content. Um, but um, really, I, I've learned over the last couple of years that I can use my business as an extension of who I am and what my personality is all about. You know, I don't have one. Um, I learned a long time ago, and I'm glad um, I did, I learned a long time ago that uh, we're all flawed humans. And there's not one person that I can hang my hat on and say, this is it. Um, this is the person. This is the one human. Um, so I would say that, you know, I love what Herb Kelleher has done with Southwest Airlines, the culture that he's built there. Um, I love Richard Branson for his ability to take risk, and he's a real rebel kind of leader. I love how Truett Cathy from Chick-fil-A has incorporated his faith into his, his, uh, into his business. Um, who else? Oh, Steve Jobs. I, I love that he's a visionary and that he has the wherewithal, tenacity, courage to take on the giant in his industry. So there's bits and pieces of a lot of people out there that I look at as, as role models, but I can't say that there's, uh, there's one business person that I hold up as you know, the end all uh, for me. There's a lot of them out there that I can just say have, in, have positively impacted me and that I have suggested that people in our organization read. I think um, Built to Last is an amazing book. I think every manager, every uh, MBA student candidate should read Built to Last. And that's where I, I, you may have picked up, if you've read it, that our mission statement doesn't talk about the hospitality industry because you know, 3M didn't start out as a scotch tape, you know, making scotch tape. They started out as a mining company. Um, so, Built to Last, I think, is great. Good to Great is obviously a great book. The 80-20 principle, uh, I think, is really important. You know, a basic business book that we give to all of our new supervisors and managers is a really easy book to read called Lincoln on Leadership um, that talks about, uh, you know, proven leadership principles. Um, one of my favorites right now that I'm having a lot of people in our organization read is uh, called Small Giants uh, by Bo Burlingham. Um, that talks about um, building a great company versus building a big company. It doesn't say that you can't be big and great, but there's certainly a difference between being great and being big. There's life outside of work. Um, you know, I guess uh, I spend uh, as much time as I can with my family. Uh, my kids, I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old right now. Um, that are just the, the joy of my life. I like to tell people, I've got a twin brother, um, who by the way is also one of my business heroes. Uh, here's a guy who was an orthopedic surgeon, um, decided he didn't really like the whole Western um, medicine part of, uh, of um, or actually the insurance part of Western medicine, became a naturopathic physician, 
and at uh, 44, 45, um, he decided, hey, I'm going to go back to what my first love was, and that's martial arts. Both he and I are black belts and uh, a couple styles of martial arts, and he um, has start, you know, started a new martial arts studio and phasing out of the medical part. So I think that's great that he's following his passion. Um, so I do a little bit of that. I work out on a speed bag uh, from time to time to take out my aggression. Um, but just spending time with my family just really grounds me. It brings me back to what's really important. Um, you know, as business leaders, we tend to think that uh, um, my whole life rises and falls with the success of our company. But uh, you know, my wife and my kids love me. You no, know, you know, no matter what the the P and L looks like. Well, I think it's yet to be achieved. Um, We've been absolutely blessed with accolades from the industry. Um, you know, I, I suppose so far, if I had to point to a couple of them, um, you know, making it into Special Forces, becoming a Green Beret was huge for me. Um, uh, last year we received Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. That was huge because that was, um, Entrepreneur saying, hey, fellow entrepreneur, this is amazing what you're building here. That was huge. But if there's one thing, it's just the company. You know, when I look at what we're building here um, and that we're doing it differently than other people, that's just, uh, I just take pride that people are willing to come and work with us. It, it blows my mind when most of these people could go someplace else, make more money. Um, um, you know, maybe have better offices that they have chosen to be on our team. That just blows my mind. I'm proud and humbled by it every day. I think that I would amass more cash and access to cash earlier um, because I don't have a background in finance, um, because I didn't have personally deep liquid pockets in the beginning, I was a little bit nervous to go out and ask for money. Frankly, right now, we have a track record where we can go out and we're, we're raising cap, you know, both debt and equity quite easy. Even now, today, in what month are we in? September of 2007, where there's kind of volatile capital markets, we're still able to put together both debt and equity packages that make our deals work. Um, but I would spend, I would have spent more time back in 2000 um, getting ready for a possible downturn. Because right now, uh, w my former company, you know, we had an earthquake in San Francisco that really shook things up. And we used to call ourselves earthquake babies because we learned to run an organization, you know, in a real streamlined fashion. Um, this whole, the perfect storm that I talked about earlier that happened in 2001 was a good reminder of, of those days. And, um, so we're always keeping our eye on, hey, when's the next downturn going to happen? But we're taking, making the best out of the situation we're in now. But clearly, revenue is the answer and it's a lot of life's problems. And so if we can have access to cash and growing revenues, I just spent more time on that back in 2000. Try to figure out what your passion is early on. Keep your motives pure. Um, I think that uh, entrepreneurs and managers are really different animals and you need to figure out pretty early on what are you, are you an entrepreneur, are you a manager, are you, are, or are you a leader? And there are a lot of self-assessment um, tools out there to help people with that. For me, recognizing that I'm a servant leader, which is different than a lot of other types of leaders out there, um, reminds me that there's no higher calling than serving others. And so if you want to be that kind of leader, that's important. But if you can figure out what's my legacy going to be, what I want my legacy to be, and as they say, begin with the end in mind. If I'm a 25-year-old um, budding manager or entrepreneur, I need to think about what do I want my organization to look like 30 years from now or 40 years from now, from now or what do I want people to be talking about me, you know, 100 years from now, and is that important to you? So I think you need to think long term. Take a you know, 30,000 foot perspective on, uh, on, on who you are.